So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me uh, all these years ago uh, to say something about Stevenson, and in this case, video games. Um, so I'm going to, to try and do two things in this presentation. The first is going to, I'm going to look at the various adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde in video games, but I'm also trying to, going to have a look at uh, what it means to play the classics in video games. So um, it's a question that has been the question of adapting classics in comics has been studied extensively. And we know how it goes. Um, adapti adapting uh, classics in comics went from subservient, very uh, transparent adaptations that meant to um, erase any hint, hint of medium specificity. Um, that's from for the 1940s to the late 1970s, early 1980s. And starting in the 1980s, the rise of other driven comics led to a more critical engagement with the classics. So the usual, the conventional mode of adaptation was retained by some publications, some publishers, but uh, all forms of co-authorship of the classics emerged uh, with the graphic novels. So I was interested in looking at video games and reflecting on whether video games offered this mo these modes of engagement with the classics, with the idea of the classics. And it seemed to me that Jekyll and Hyde offered an interesting, um, interesting corpus for that, precisely because, so it's, an, it's a ubiquitous motif. Uh, video games use the Jekyll and Hyde motif everywhere. Uh, you'll get tr physical transformations, you'll get allusions, you'll get references. But what about direct adaptations? Direct adaptations are interesting in that, in the case of Jekyll and Hyde, compared to, say, Frankenstein, there is no authoritative version. You cannot refer to any specific version that defines our popular vision of Jekyll and Hyde apart from the original novella. So the adaptation network exists for Jekyll and Hyde. But that adaptation network, the center of gravity, is still to be found in the novel. In other words, to produce a video game based on Jekyll and Hyde is to go back to the novel, is to go back to the idea of the classic, as opposed to just creating a new object on the periphery of a sprawling adaptation network defined by works belonging to visual culture, TV shows, movies, as is the case for Frankenstein and arguably for Sherlock Holmes and many of, the, many of these uh, Victorian creations. Also, Jekyll and Hyde, by virtue of being a gothic novella, by virtue of belonging to the, to the fantastic, to horror, um, offered a fruitful ground for adaptation because these are genres in which video games fairly usually traffic. So it's compatible with video games in a way that, say, Jane Austen novels aren't, or aren't that easily. And it's in the public domain. It's been in the public domain for as long as video games have existed, so it makes it easy to, to, to adapt. And um, so that's the general situation. My observation is that there have only been six adaptations, straight adaptations, of Jekyll and Hyde in video games. So that number doesn't mean much, but there, are, there have been over 100 Frankenstein adaptations, over 50 Dracula adaptations, maybe the other way around. But anyway, um, it's a canonical text, it's a classic, it's one that is widely acknowledged, but it's one that is not adapted that much. So here's my corpus. Uh, games from, published between 1988 and 2017. None of these games are classics, video game classics. None of these games matter. They are all average, and frankly, and as a quick aside, very mediocre games. Uh, I was expecting some sort of pleasure to be from the experience of playing these games. Alas, it was not to be. Uh, so 1988 to, to 2017, and covering a variety of platforms and a variety of genres. I, I'm going to, to add that the, uh, these games were published by Ger French, German, Japanese publishers, but that's not a point I'm going to cover today. Uh, there's a transnational aspect, a tr transnational approach to these games, which would probably be relevant, but I don't have time to, to get into, into this. 
1988, the first adaptation on the Atari ST and the ZX Spectrum and probably other platforms, but it's, it's a game that is a bit hard to find today. Uh, it's a text adventure in which you play as Jekyll and you try to you try to create the po a potion that will turn you into Hyde and then you try to solve that specific problem. Uh, the 1988 platformer Jekyll and Hyde on the Nintendo Entertainment System is an infamous game widely described as one of the worst games ever produced for that platform, which is not entirely accurate, but not that wrong either. Um, a 2001 3D adventure by French publisher Creo um, and I'm going to, to show you pictures of that. Uh, another rather similar game from 2010, which is more of an adventure game, uh, also called Jekyll and Hyde, uh, which is very obscure, uh, rightly so. Um, and uh, in the same year, a hidden object game published on a variety of, of portable platforms. So it exists on phones, it exists on, it exists on the Nintendo DS. It's been published on any platform in which you can look, you can play a hidden object game. So basically the point of the game is to look for objects that are clever, uh, random objects uh, hidden, in a, uh, hidden in a picture. And once you get them all, you get to play other mini games and see the story unfold. And finally, uh, the latest version, which, is, which I'm going to come back to in my conclusion, which is a Mass M Jekyll and Hyde, here class classified as an adventure game, which I'm going to redefine as a visual novel and one which, uh, which offers the, mo the most uh, relevant form of engagement with the idea of the classic uh, in all that corpus. So I started with two ideas. The first was that all of these adaptations, these six adaptations, which in one way or another engage with the idea of the classics, that to adapt Jekyll and Hyde, well, you have to, to have a good reason. Uh, so that reason, um, my expectation was that these games would gesture toward the idea of the classics. The, my second hypothesis was that these would be subservient adaptations, that they would resemble the classics illustrated approach to, to, um, to classical literature. That is, they would try to downplay medium specificity and to emphasize their reliance on the classic. So that was the initial idea. Uh, that turned out to be very wrong. So how do, how do these games engage with the idea of the classics? Well, they do that by mentioning Stevenson's text. So as you can see, this is probably the image that pops in your, in your mind when you think of Jekyll and Hyde, a greenish purplish monster with a, with a top hat. Uh, and the... Um, that 1988 version does something that is fairly typical. It includes a brief reference to the novella on the, in, in the packaging. So it's a brief reference to be, in this case, that's the first line. Uh, so it, it is rather prominent. And it, um, it employs a, the fairly established um, strategy of claiming that the adaptation helps something come to life. This is something that you find in comics adaptations. This is something that you find in film adaptations. Whenever something that comes from literature is, ap is adapted, it comes to life. You get to see it move. You get to, you get to, to hear it. The, the 2001 adventure game uh, uses a uh, fairly similar strategy, describing its relationship to the novella by saying, it is freely inspired by Stevenson's famous novel, A Pinnacle of 19th Century Literature. This is in the English version, the French version, assuming pr probably that French people aren't uh, familiar with Stevenson, removes any reference to Stevenson. Uh, it's not to be found in the game manual. It's not to be found anywhere. So it's a bit mysterious as to why you would publish a, a, a game under the name of Jekyll and Hyde and assume no familiarity with the, with the novel. But so it happens. The most elaborate engagement with the, with, with the source material is to be found in the paratext to the 2017 version, which uh, not only refers to the novella, but also gives its publication date, and which also again claims that the novel comes to life, that you'll be able to interact with the novel, but which, uh, which adopts a very referential approach to the novel. In other cases, you get allusions, you get, you get um, brief mentions, 
a thrilling hidden object game, not thrilling, based on the popular characters, Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, that's on the left. A and in this case, this is a 2010 adventure game, classic adventure with elements of action and skills. And I'm mm. assuming that classic here is meant as, an, uh, as a sly reference to the idea of the classic because the game is anything but a classic. I mean, it does, it is a fairly standard game, um, so classic can mean that, but I'm, I'm assuming that the word was chosen with a purpose. So that's one of the way these games present themselves as adaptations, by simply referring to the novel. The other way, the, the, the other trace of the presence of the novel in the games is through what, I, what I'm calling here typographical inter-iconicity. This is the box art to the spectrum version of the text adventure. And it simply says Jekyll and Hyde in longhand, uh, as if the choosing that typeface was uh, um, sufficient to recall analog media. And this is something that you find in all of these games. They insist on using antiquated typefaces or uh, hand-drawn letters as if to signal not anything that has to do with Victorian technology, much less with Victorian printing technology, but the idea of the classic conveyed by the idea of something that is written and mm -hmm. something that is handwritten. So here it's not about, of course, it's not about historical accuracy. It's about conveying the idea of literature as something that is produced by a single hand, which is um, fitting because, as you know, video games are usually team efforts. Uh, even the, even the, the, the oldest video games in, the, in my corpus uh, have, were produced by, by, uh, by, by collective efforts. So this is a sample of various loading screens and in-game uh, in screens. And you, can, you do see this emphasis. Uh, and, uh, this is, uh, these games were produced, um, were produced uh, 20 years apart, and they employ the same strategy. Jekyll is, uh, use, will use your uh, regular, uh, regular rigid typeface, whereas Hyde has this uh, element of horror. The jagged typeface is, a, is of, co of course, one way to refer to horror, but also one way to refer to this handmade classical quality. This typographical intericonicity um, echoes a strategy that is often found in video games, that is telling the, telling the story through manuscripts, found notes, bits of writing that can be found in the story world. So this is a common strategy, and comics, uh, sorry, game scholars have argued that this is one way in which the Gothic imagination is present in video games through this idea of the scattered archive that has to be interacted with, completed, and the fragmented memories that can be found everywhere. And you get a bit of that. You get, a, you get in a number of these games, um, again, gestures towards the archive, gestures towards the lost, the fragmented memories. And I'm going to, and even something that um, is a form of um, um, an emphasis on the codex. Uh, there are many books to be found in these games, not just notes, not just bits of papers, but books and passages to be read. And strikingly, most of these games, even though they belong to, they, they belong to a variety of genres, uh, integrate not direct quotes from the novels, but echoes, passages, rewritings. It varies from game, to ga from game to game, but you do get this form of codological imagination, the imagination of the codex that is manifest in all of, the, in all of these games, even in games in which it is unexpected. And um, I was um, going through reviews for the hidden object game, the 2010 version, and most of the reviews emphasize the fact that this is a fairly typical game, except for the fact that there's a lot of reading to do, which fans of the game genre uh, objected to. Uh, you have to read text before you get to play the game, but that was a distinctive feature of that hidden object game compared to, compared to others. So these games do gesture towards um, Stevenson's novel, but that's not what they're interested in. 
what they're interest, interested in is Victorian. The, these are Victorian games or neo-Victorian games more than they are Stevenson's adaptations. And it's very striking to realize that most of these games actually coexist, are um, echoes of other more successful games that referred to Victorian texts. So for instance, the, Jekyll, the 1988 um, Nintendo version, Jekyll and Hyde, is an action platformer that was published shortly after the very successful C Castlevania uh, by Konami, which is also an action platformer game uh, and which also which relies on Stoker, which relies on um, on, go on Gothic literature, but on the more the most established texts of go Gothic literature. Uh, the 2001 3D adventure game, um, which uh, which has a very Tim Burton approach to vi to, to Victorian Britain, was produced shortly after American Ma McGee's Alice, uh, which is a dark retelling of Alice in Wonderland with deformed, uh, with deformed an anatomy and, um, again, a very Bretonian take on Alice. Um, finally, the, finally, the Mazem, the publisher of the 2017 game, um, also are inter also interested in adapting other um, long 19th century texts. I'm a bit reluctant to call them uh, to call them Victorian texts because, of course, the Phantom of the Opera is not a Victorian text. But I'm using the the notion of the long 19th century, uh, which Eric Altman, the historian, uses to refer to that long European era of the of the empires uh, ending with the First World War. And um, this is the the cluster of texts to which to which these adaptations belong. This Victorian this fetish Victorian fetishism. Uh, is obvious in the care that is put in having snappy suits and corsets. Uh, this is what these games are interested in. Dark alleys, uh, towering buildings, um, and suits. Suits are very important. This is what, what, this is what, what you find in the, the Nintendo game. Um, doesn't move well. It's not interested in telling a great story. But it is good looking. And this idea of having good-looking games, games that emphasize the presentation of Victorian era through a variety of approaches. So this is a 2001 version, which I described as being inspired by Tim Burton. Uh, this is something that reviewers pointed out at the, pointed out at the time. Um, this is something that runs through the games. Perhaps more strikingly, the 2017 Amazon version, which presents, is a, which presents uh, it's the game as a form of dollhouse version of Victorian London. It's not meant to be faithful. It's meant to be a recreation of a set. Mm. And there is something striking in all of these games is that they are not interested in engaging with Victorian era as an era of politics, as an era of, uh, as a, uh, they are not interested in the power structure. They are not in interested in inequalities. They're interested in, again, the suits, the s closed sets, the idea of not offering an expensive world to inhabit, but offering set pieces in which the player is expected to find familiarity with these uh, familiarity with pre-existing representations. It's very striking to me, and that's a very quick aside because I'm running out of time. That uh, this version does look like a dollhouse and paper dolls that you move in the, that you move in these environments, and it's fruitfully compared to. Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which is an expensive game also set in Victorian London, but in which the idea of recreating a world that, that you can explore leads the game to integrate uh, posters and slums and places that you would not visit because they are not typical. And so, so you get to see all of that by virtue of having a world to explore. These games are not interested in that. They're interested in staging Victoria, in fetishizing Victoria. Skipping the idea of the, the game genres, uh, the, the game genres, uh, just to, to briefly mention the fact that, uh, of course, adapting Jekyll and Hyde uh, in a video game offers a specific challenge, which is who are you going to play? Are you going to play boring old Addison, who is a absolutely, uh, who is focused on repressing every hint of pleasure, or are you going to play with, as Hyde or Jekyll? And the games offer a variety of answers to that, to that, that, to that question. Uh, you, in the first 
In the first games, you typically play as Jekyll, trying not to become Hyde. The, the early 2000 versions both offer, uh, both position the player as Jekyll and Hyde. This is the version of Hyde as a superpower. This is a version of Hyde which I think corresponds to the League of the Ag Extraordinary Gentlemen version. That is the version of Hyde which is to be understood in the remix uh, era in which all of these uh, Victorian texts are cobbled together and are aligned with superhero texts, with teams like, I mean, the, um, these are the 2001 games, um, the 2001 and 2010 games, to me belong to, uh, should be understood uh, in the same vein as uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, uh, Killer? Hunter? Killer? Anyway, uh, one of these, or uh, Pride and Prejudice, Prejudice and Zombies, and again, uh, the League of the Extraordinary Gentlemen, as of belonging to that, not neo-Victorian approach, but that, um, that idea that all of these texts belong to a sort of shared universe uh, that, that obeys the rules of popular culture. So I know I'm running out of time and I'm, I'm going to, to just say a few words about the one adaptation which, in light of all of this, uh, the one adaptation that includes Addison, for instance, the one adaptation that gestures towards, uh, that gestures towards the original novel, and that's the 2017, ver the 2017 version. A game of detection, a game uh, that acknowledges the novel, a game that aligns the novel, uh, that, that aligns the players with the novel's protagonist, a game that does include a heavy dose of Victorian fetishism, but that is also text heavy. And what's fascinating to me is that uh, this is from a publisher which has made a specialty of adapting these Victorian classics, these long 19th century classics. So they describe their own game as a sort of linear visual novel. Uh, and in their, on their website, they emphasize faithfulness. They emphasize this idea of uh, playing with the original text. And on the left here, and this is my final slide, on the left here, uh, you, you have what they, they advertise on their website. Our games are designed to offer the players the experience of reading a book. In this age of short sprints, people often feel unprepared to commit themselves to the long and steady running involved in reading a book. Mazam hopes to serve as a fresh stimulus to people who are reluctant to do so. We hope that this stimulus would blossom and bear fruit and thus satisfy the desire not only of children and young adults, but also of mature audience, uh, audiences to revisit these stories. And I'm not going to read the full quote, but this is, what we'll, this is the text that accompanied uh, the first issue of Classics, Classics Comics that later became Classics Illustrated in 1941. And I'm sure you can read this. This is the exact same argument. So at the end of this study, um, it seems to, I was expecting to see more of a coherence between these various game adaptations. What I found instead was a fascination not with the original text, which is often used as a pretext, as an excuse to produce yet another uh, game set in, Victor in Victorian era. What I was not expecting also is to see that video games seems to be replaying the rhetoric of adaptation and ad adapting the classic, which has been uh, in place for, in the case of comics, for 80 years, and to see uh, that approach reproduced faithfully, reproduced almost um, in an uh, almost identical fashion uh, for, for um, a, a very different medium. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the anti the, this, anti the, this entire corpus, this entire uh, um, calls attention to the fact that, to answer my original question, there does not seem to be a defined way of playing the classics yet. Thank you for your attention.